Hi there. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tinnitus TV. Today, I am talking to Kevin Drew of Broken Social Scene. You know, just like the rest of us, he's getting older and dealing with the joys and the tragedies that brings. But unlike most of us, Kevin Drew has the ability to channel those experiences into gorgeous and personal works of art. I'm referring, of course, to his latest solo album, the fittingly titled Aging. Inspired by a series of recent personal losses, the broken social scene frontman and his collaborator Niall Spencer have crafted an immersive record from layers of lush synthesizers, low impact beatboxes, and Drew's earnest, dreamy vocals. Not bad for a project that started out as a children's album. Midway between the vinyl and digital releases of Aging, the 47-year-old singer zoomed in from his Toronto home for a wide-ranging chat about unleashing his inner child, hand tattoos, the brilliance of Warren Zevon, the next Broken Social Scene album, and a lot more. Enjoy. Well, let's let's uh, let's uh, get down to business here um, and talk about uh, this new album, Aging. Um, I, I would be remiss, I guess, if I did not point out that unless you've been pulling some sort of long con, you're only in your 40s. So aging seems like, uh, you know, you're one of these 30 year olds who's writing their memoirs, you know? No, I, I'm 47. I wasn't really talking about myself. I was talking about just more the idea of continuation and, um, at the time when I was recording this, my mother was not not well, and now she passed away July 18th of this year. And uh, it was just a month before our first song came out. And um, I was just reflecting on watching her suffering through her body giving out on her and her mind starting to leave her. And through that process, it was forcing me to be in denial, uh, look look at those who I lost, um, because I've lost a lot of people now at this point in my life, which I, I didn't, I wasn't, I, I look around at my friends and I just see some of them and I think, how, how do they, how do they not have more loss in their life? Uh, um, but uh, I was just sort of going through the journals of wanting to make a kid's record. That's how this whole thing started. And, and also it started because it was the pandemic. And of course, Toronto was on lockdown longer than any other city. So I needed to find things to do. And Niall Spencer up at the bathhouse, he's been, we've been working together for over for a decade now. And the bathhouse is a place mm -hmm. where I've really, it's, it's, it's not like a second home to me, but it's, it, it's where I do, my work and after Gord died it gave me sort of a sense of still being in that in that world and in the realm and around that energy um so I did go up there with the intention of sort of writing some children's songs and we fell into this tune don't be afraid of the dark and I I knew I wanted a woman for that I just I was sort of writing songs to see who, what artists I could get to because I have such a wide selection of friends. Fortunately, I met some incredible people in my time. Also met some not so incredible people in my time. Um, but that's what happens when you're out there and you're working in the world as opposed to one town. Um, so once we we stumbled upon that and and Niall said, "Look, I'll put you through Auto Tune and we'll give you a sort of." feministic sort of way of cadence um it made me think of my mom mm. and it made me think of lullabies of my mom and how she used to sing me and i was seeing her her body start to fold like a napkin it was just starting to fold in on itself and the tension that was around that and i thought to myself maybe i just sort of write about and you have to understand at the time, not for anything, but that moment. I had I had another sort of heartbreak. I, I've been in denial about being heartbroken for long over a decade now and always putting things in front of it and getting in relationships and trying to build foundation and homes and walls. But it's all just 
it's dust, it's Plato, it's, it's not, it's not sustainable. And why, why I mentioned that is, is because I can get stuck in that loop and I can get stuck in that pattern. And suddenly there I was in the fall of 2021, um, lived, moved out of Toronto, was living alone in, 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 you know, a beautiful, I, I'm very grateful and very privileged, but a beautiful home, but just sort of alone with the trees. And I was just reflection time. So I thought about my friends who've died. And I thought about my mom, who I knew eventually was going to die, did not expect her to die this last summer. But I, I sort of went into the journal and pulled out these songs. And I wasn't writing so much about myself aging. I was just writing about how I think it's beautiful, you know, the inevitability of aging. But then at the same time, watching my mother crumble into herself uh, and her body just give out on her and her mind give out on her. and just this constant idea that she kept saying she was gonna get better and she didn't. And it haunted me as much as it fucked me up. So once we finished this, I felt kind of cathartically like I had done something, first of all. Mm. Uh, it's the life of an artist is always like, there's no routine and it's crushing as you get older that when you get a taste of routine, it's it's actually addictive. It's, the, it's my biggest addiction now. I'm like, I want routine, I want routine. Uh, but then I put it on the shelves and I put it on the shelves for many reasons, some of which uh, was just because I couldn't carry it. I couldn't carry this record of the, the, the emotion that I went into. I was going back to my childhood self. I was going back to party Kev. This is how I deal with pain, you know, pain party Kevy and getting out there. And is everybody else okay? And what do you need? And what do you need? And high fives and, wands and sulking and all the shit that you pretend you don't have in your life but it's right beside you if you let it be that was a very long answer it was uh and it raises 75 other questions uh first of all condolences <laughs> to you, Mom. I, I lost mine a couple of years ago i know what it's like to go through that um yeah there you go well condo sorry I, my condolences to you i never lost a parent and now i'm starting to understand this indefinite hole that you live with i didn't know when i, right. I have friends who've lost parents i didn't know it was going to be like this but thank you and also condolences to you moms thank you yeah yeah exactly what can you say um but so i find it i mean in hindsight was the notion of wanting to make a children's album uh kind of an act of I don't know, denial, uh, repression, not wanting to face all of this on your part, because it just seems like such a polar swing from, you know, kids album to this really, you know, deep dive into life and death and aging and loss and all that, you know? Yeah, um, I've been talking about making a kids record with some people now for a long time. I got a dear friend where we were going to join forces with his friends and my friends and sort of comedians and musicians. Um, and then I've got a couple of just mind blowing people doing some songs. And I've just constantly been circling around children because I love to tell children stories. Mm. Uh, but I think you're nailing it where for some reason <laughs> I said, okay, I'll take it upon myself and we'll get social. I, I'm always trying to figure out uh, work for social scene. Mm. I'm trying to figure out work for the band members and how to create income for them. And I thought, okay, well, maybe this would be cool and it would be good for arts and crafts. And we'd have this kid's album and we can incorporate a charity. And um, But I think in the way that you said that, I think I dove, you know, I, I dove into the inner child and then the inner child was just saying to me, your mother's dying very slowly. Okay. And I had to suddenly go take a step back and realize I can't, not recognize that now you know so there was so the floodgates just kind of opened at that point really with with you know after you did the after you did afraid of the dark was it just kind of you know here we go this is this is the only path forward and it just came fast after yeah that? well i i had songs like uh out in the fields was from 2014 elevator i wrote elevators i wrote 2018 party oven 2018 so i had some songs where i thought to myself Oh, I, I, you know, we partied into your grave. Was that okay? 
I love always love that notion. And that came from uh, a friend talking about, you know, the loss of someone that we shared. And he said to me after they passed, did, did we party too much? And I just thought, did we party too much? Basically standing at a memorial asking that. And I thought, that's wild. I'm not sure. I need to think about that. So, and the idea of elevator, I, you know, you, you take, you take what you're living and you turn it into a song that comes from a source, but you can create it into something that it, it metaphorically can go deeper for you. Um, I've always been a big fan of people and studying people and never choosing sides, which you get in trouble for now, but just in the idea of trying to figure out why does that person think this way? Why does that person think this way? Why do they feel that way? Why do they feel well? I just take it in so that I can have different perspectives of writing. Because I also write, I write stories, I write scripts, all these things. And I'm just constantly writing when I'm not procrastinating. So do you have uh, like and, a, a, a vast archive of of songs that are just sitting around kind of waiting for a place or a time or an opportunity to to pull them out and group them together into into albums yes i do and i know a lot of us do actually i mean sure unfortunately social scene built some sort of force field around us where we never get asked that much for songwriting we never get asked for being a band in a studio the soundtrack work we don't get asked there's something that we now we there was a false reputation built around us back when we started because we said no to this commercial but then these myths start getting built and i met with music supervisors in la and they reminded me of how we burned them when we said no to this thing and then i had to walk them through how that never happened and uh -huh. it really kind of irked them we're kind of like that actually and then you know get people involved but there's a thing about us where you know, people always say to me, wow, you're so busy, you're so busy, you're so busy. How, how do we work with you? You're so busy or you're this and that. And a lot of the time I'm working for free because I'm working with friends of mine or people that inspire me or, or some musicians where they don't have the cash, but they've got the spirit and they've got the stuff that I was sort of like, okay, let's go and do this. But it's very, it's limiting for, for all of us, especially living in Toronto. And then you put in Canada, but then around the world, we've never really been able to dive into the realm of songwriting. So even though I have a publishing company with arts and crafts, I think that works against me as well because you're constantly working with other artists. And right. I recently did a writing session in Nashville that was set up with a guy that's on arts and crafts. And I walked into this room, this, you know, it was in a house and the guy, lovely guy. And uh, he asked me what I did and what I do. And, do I have a band? And I just thought, well, I own the publishing company that you signed to. And he went, what? And then I'm in this band and then he's pulling it up on Spotify. But I say that in the idea that it's just, it seems so silly to me. And he thought it was so silly to him as well. And there we were. And then we didn't end up writing because we just ended up sort of chatting and talking about what's going on with him. And, and it's just, it really made me smile. It's like, well, that was my one Nashville writing experience. Um, but I know I have piles, Charlie has piles, Brendan, well, we, we, we compare our voice memos. I'm like, well, I'm at 292 and Canning will be like, I'm at 476. You know? <laughs> Those are like just song snippets and ideas and thoughts and things yeah, like that. Yeah, we just, you know, piano and, and playing. And Charlie's, Charles Spirit is, I mean, this guy should be dusting all the Grammys and all the awards for just being a magical musician. Right. Um, very underused. And, so when and, you've got all that have... stuff though, when you've got that kind yeah. of bench of songs to draw from, um, to make an album like this then, is it is it just a matter of sort of going into your archives and going this one, this one, this one, or yeah. you know, how do you, how do you, that, that's, you know, kind of what you did here? Cause I, I have to say, I, I mean, it does not sound like an album that was um, written piecemeal over the course of a decade. It, it has a a cohesion, and I, I don't just mean sonically because it was obviously all recorded, you know, at the same time. But uh, it, it it feels like a, a quote unquote album, you know. 
Well, thank you. And that just speaks to Niles and I work together so, so, so well now because we've been working together for over 10 years um, that there, we don't, there's not much has to be said. It's just asking about opinions. I trust his sounds. He trusts my songs um, and my performances. And we just, we've always worked together, but it was so lovely to just have Niles be the producer on this, on this uh, record. And it was very organic. It, it just sort of, after Don't Be Afraid of the Dark came Party Oven. And I knew I wanted to sing that. And then after that, I had a piano riff that then turned into All My Fails. And then we went into Awful Lightning where I sort of thought to myself, I'm going to sing about my mom. You know, and this is 2021 when I was dropping Awful Lightning down because I just found the the aspect of that to be what I felt my family was dealing with. Um, and then you just, you go from there and Elevator was a riff and the, you know, that was written in 2018 about people coming for you, you know, and the actual, I love the aspect of asking an elevator to change its name. Um, so I thought that's going to fit in this. And then when we were done, I said to Niles, what about out in the fields, which I gave, I, I presented it to social scene in 2016. I said, guys, I have this song mm -hmm. and it's basically that same recording. Um, but from other sessions I did with Niles, I also had this song skyline and they said, we love skyline. Let's take skyline. So out in the fields just sat on the shelf. And as I said, I, I always thought someone else was going to sing it. Whenever I do my Bono sort of adult contemporary Chris Martin stuff where I'm going for it, I'm always writing for someone to carry that because I feel I am more in the art rock indie zone of where right. bury the vocals and let's do them. But also when you get older and you start collecting these these medals of loss through your friends dying and, and through relationships ending and through just the heartache of not being where you thought and all these suicidal hotline gestures, you then realize you can carry this stuff and you can sing this stuff. And I didn't really, I didn't think I was gonna put this record out. I put it on the shelf for two years. I was kind of annoyed with my community for a while. Um, and I just thought, I'm not, I'm not into this. So I parked it and then, it was uh, a guy at my label, Cam Reed, who, who was just saying, we should do this. We should put it out. And then uh, kudos to Brendan Canning, just one conversation. I said, what do I do? Am I going to go? And he said, you've made an album. You, you you should put it out. So I never played it for my mom. And that was fine. It wasn't, I didn't really particularly feel like playing that to her. And we were listening to, you know, the Drifters and Pavarotti and Rod Stewart and Linda Rostan and just, you know, the do run, run, runs, all the Motown. We were trying to surround her with music while she was getting, um, you know, worse and worse and more ill, but she loved music. So I didn't realize that, and you, how could one, but we, I don't know, her dying, it was just such strange timing. And it, and I knew leading up to it because I was hitting the bottle and I'm sort of got that English Irish way of guiding your emotions by suddenly when you wake up and you're like, Oh shit, what happened last night? You know, something's coming. And, um, yeah, this record wasn't about grief. It was about life. And now right. it's kind of sort of become album about grief and i know ariel who i i love to death her record left force her record skeletons I and mean, that is a deep album just came out uh and it's it's going deep into grief you know her father passing away six years ago i believe it was six years ago and just listening to that and i listened to that um while i was on the road a few weeks ago just because I didn't mean to stumble into saying I'm making a record about grief when you have this dear friend of yours who's 
making a record about grief. <laughs> it's clearly, but I was just kind of making a record and then I didn't think I was going to put it out. And it was about what it was always about. But when suddenly your mother dies, it takes on a whole new, it just takes on this whole new meaning. And then you're trying to hold on to that while going through the stages, which that was kind of the first time I really went through those stages of grief because I was all over the map after she passed. You know, I mean, I have to say that, that you know, yes, it's an album about grief, but I think it's also about life, too, as you said. And and I have to say that I think if people who might, you know, be listening to us talk without having heard the music um, will think it's this, you know, collection of, of bleak, stark, minor key piano ballads. And, and it's anything but. I mean, it's a really uh, no. beautiful and warm and immersive album. I mean, I think you... You Thank do you. yourself no favors in in some of the the press material with this, where you use phrases like a "world sick" and and you know, because to me it's it's almost um, uplifting in down. its own way, you know. Change the bio. <laughs> <laughs> you got, we got to change that bio stat. It's <laughs> a well. I think I can't help. I mean. I, I mean, I'm talking about this, but it's yeah. a personal view. I don't think it's a sad record. I mean, I think there's no. some moments. I mean, also, it's not for me to judge. I am I know what it is for me, but I don't know of anything I've done in the last 27 years that hasn't had joy to it or hope to it or, yeah. or powerful. It's, it's I mean, sad, I'm, like, that, it's sad it, like life is sad sometimes and, and joyful like yeah. life is joyful sometimes. But I guess I'm wondering... Um, do you feel a little more? Yeah, I'm going to take that note though. Hold on just really quickly. Uh -huh. That's a really good note. And I appreciate that because I, I mean, look, this is my what third interview. I haven't talked to anybody in three years and trust me, there's times I wanted to scream at people. Uh, Let it out, my friend. This is a but, safe spot. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. But now I'm able to talk because I only want to speak when I'm out there promoting something. You know, that's what social media is for me now, especially because it's become such a cancer in our, you know, in humanity that I realized, OK, if this really is for my work, then I'm just going to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm going to take that note from you. Thank you. I mean, I, I don't mean to be sad, but this is my third interview. My mother died. I'm trying to figure I got people warning me. Don't talk about it too much because then you'll give away and then you'll feel like you gave away. But I love my mom. My mom and I were so close. And I love her and I love talking about her and I want to talk about her. So I think I talk about it because I want to hear myself talk about her. And also she would probably love your note because she'd be like, enough with the smile. Come on, let's go. You know, bring let's bring it up a bit, Kevin. I'm like, oh sorry, Mom. She, you know, she was always like, oh God, please don't tell me about uh. Well, I think I think talking about you know what comes what's behind a lot of it, it, it illuminates and it adds depth to the album and it, it allows people to under uh, understand it and appreciate more. I mean, I do get the sense though that you are a little perhaps more protective of this one than you might be of you know some of the other ones that that you've done. Well, it's also a different time. Um, I'm protective because I have to be a middle class and. Uh, it's hard out there and it's, you know, I constantly am talking to people who want to quit. I'm talking to fellow peers who things aren't working out. Um, you know, I, people would say it's self-centered to think you can make little changes, but even how I was rolling this record out, I was trying to get in record stores first yes. and then put it on streaming. Cause also I can hit streaming with like extended remixes and all these things. I just thought, why don't I try that? And then I went into my favorite record store. I wasn't in there and I was told it was because of this. And then it wasn't because of that. And what, and it's tiring. You're just sort of, you just, you get tired by the constant same conversations, same problems, same loops within this, this, this industry, especially within the Canadian one. Um, and it's tough in this position. So I protect not only the work but i protect my friends around me and musicians because it's, it's just it's just the we have gone way down the list and people are so 
involved in themselves now and involved in finding their own identity through themselves and not through art, and not through music, that um, I think it has not made us a better society because of that. But I just think it's it's something where I've got to constantly be alert to make sure that my friend's work is not on the same level as the guy down the road's photos of pine cones with his you know bare feet going like, check out how my feet look like this pine cone. And then I have some, you know, dear friend of mine has been working for 29 years, putting out a record. It's like, well, that's, that's prominent. You're down here. So I have to be protective, man. Or I would, wouldn't be here. Fair enough. I would have that's... taken that pill and said, see you later. Because the aspect of where we're at, from what we knew or what we tasted or what we experienced. And this is also a, an aging thing in itself. You know, you watch the industry go and like, do, 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 and your friends, same age and older, like, bup, 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 but you're like, do, 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 do. And so I have to be protective and I have to be aware of my surroundings of who's, who's not doing well, who's not doing well for their own personal reasons and who's not doing well for the industry reasons. And I have to keep my, senses about me because we also have to spin that eternally grateful sweater we have to just constantly wear it like super grateful thank you super grateful thank you super grateful thank you super grateful thank you you know well, so I mean, it's this yes line and no but you you know you you do work hard and you do earn your you know your right to uh, everything you have i mean it's not like you've uh not put in the time and the hours and made the music and done the work and been, I mean, you just got off the road again, right? You, uh, you guys were just mm -hmm. out there touring. And I, I mean, that must be mm -hmm. interesting to be out at this point in, in time in terms of you don't have a new album out. So uh, what's, what are those shows like? Is it just the diehards or, uh, or um, and is it a different feel to performing at this point when you're not sort of in that uh, blatant selling mode, you know? um it's both I'm, I'm the last two we did a tour last year and a tour this last fall and tour this fall mm -hmm. and as a band we we were i can't say we've never been better because but we were so locked together and the shows were so good um and for me i love it because i get to take a lot of time where i, can, I play back i don't have to be in the front all the time so i could get right. i even go to the audience and watch them a couple like a few so there's a couple songs where i can just say eh, they don't need me on keys and i just go out and check it out depending on what the energy is in the room but no we are uh we have had incredible shows mm -hmm. incredible shows and and a couple you know some of them there's some diehards but mainly people are coming out and there's new audiences coming out and people are discovering mm -hmm. us still to this day and I have no plans in, in not touring. In fact, I uh, I think we all over this last year and coming back after the pandemic have really um, upped our game and enjoying it, enjoying each other and making it the best it can be for those who pay their money to come and see us. And we just sort of, we play our guts out and we move and trust me, we are icing ourselves down after the show. <laughs> but uh, it's it's been it's been good. I mean, I'm excited. We played uh, out in the fields on this tour. So I explained, hey, I had my solo record out there on the show uh, at the merch booth and we played it and it was great. I mean, the band, the, the, they all got behind it and it was wonderful. So we did have some new stuff as Brendan Canning's father was asking recently, like, you got any new cuts that you're playing? Um, even he, even and... he's tired of hearing the old stuff, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, we... It's, you know, we have a very deep catalog within the yes. realm of we can play each other's records, solo records. And uh, I don't, I'm not that person that says, I mean, these songs are our children. These songs are closer than me and some of the band members now. And um, I don't have a problem. I don't look at it like we're looking back. I look at it like we're playing for the first time every time we're out there playing mm -hmm. and we're connecting with people. And especially when you have new audiences coming out, it feeds into that. So I have no problem um, looking backwards to push the responsibility of moving forwards even further, you know, moving that needle even further. I think it's something that there doesn't have to be an insecurity about. And there was absolutely no vulnerability in these tours. We came to play and we did.
Well, I guess that begs the question then that, especially with the 25th anniversary of the band coming up next year, um, it's been, you know, six it's years since, uh, supposedly 1999, if you believe the internet again. Um, so, you know. It's true. That's when Brendan and I fell in love. Brendan and I fell and in love. That's when the bromance <laughs> began. And so uh, six years since the last album, or even four, if you count the EPs together as an album, um people are gonna you know i i would think it, it's time to make a new album is it not it is uh, and are you going very to much uh yeah we are, currently are i mean i don't know what to say we're, we've we we're uh we're in that process okay. remember when you weren't supposed to talk about it i don't even know anymore what the this does it matter but yeah we, we're we're in the studio all right so you, you and so what is now, now how does that work for you guys is that is that a process where you book time and everybody comes in with their stuff and then you just work it out as in the room together on the fly or is a thing where you're getting together ahead of time comparing notes and going in with stuff to work on I think it's a bit of everything and also we we, we haven't even reached out to some of the people yet and um, as I said, we the band came up here to my house, and usually my mom would have came up, so that kept me away from my mom, and then she was never able to get back up here again and died. So I said, whatever we did when we were up here, we're gonna have to not everything, but we have to we have to honor that. We have to honor her. So that's what sort of pushing me in the making of this record. But it's early days, and uh, there's no when people ask me, it's like it's just there's no there's no there, it's all over the place it can be whatever it wants to be now right there, nobody has any identity when it comes to the band or making a record now there's nothing that's on the line we're still here and we're still doing it so everyone just wants to play and be a part of whatever it needs to be so you got classically trained berkeley kids coming in and playing one note on a song because that's all it needs right and that says a lot because you make records, you live and die by them. And now I'm not saying we're sitting back and relaxing by any means. I'm just saying we're we're realizing that it's pretty wild that we're still able to do it. It's pretty mm -hmm. wild that we're still here. And when we're in the studio, we don't want to step on each other's toes. We want to have, we just want to see whatever happens, happens. And that's kind of where we're at right now. And we'll see how, where it goes from there. But um I'm excited to talk about it at a later time because I feel yes, like for sure, of course, early days. I, I mean, I think feel like there's, there's great energy around it. There's great there. There's there's nothing but love around it. That's all there is. Yeah. So with, with a process like that, like that though, it seems to me that it it, it sounds like a lot of cat herding, and it it, it strikes oh, me yeah. as, as something where it, how do you know when when you've got something or when something's finished or when it's an album. It seems like a very vague uh, sort of there's no real beginning, there's no real ending, stuff just happens, and at some point you run out of time process, you know? Well, you never run out of time, but no, I I, I don't know. I, I'm, it's been, once again, seven years since we've done this, so mm. I always think we, we just agree when the song's done. It's it's pretty simple. You, you're you writing a song, you're writing a jam, Uh. uh you feel it out. Everyone's intuition in this band's fantastic. So it's not something that uh, it's not it's not difficult. Well, I think what di what's difficult is when you have so many songs and so many ideas, and then you start being like, "Well, that one." Uh. So um, I know people want to get in and get out, so that we don't do that again. But I, I like I said, I I don't think about it much. Um, I just kind of try to let it happen. And I like to work really quickly, uh, especially when I'm working with other bands. I, I try to say, I mean, Niles and I did this record in a week, basically. Um, wow. And it's because you don't want to, I like the first takes. I like the first thoughts. I like finding the song. I don't want, um, obviously, if you need to nail something and you want to polish something, I understand that. But I like the idea of, uh just sort of off the cuff and finding it and i never C used capturing to it. but now capturing that, it right yeah. yeah that's where that's where i like to live now and i i like to put time limits on things and just sort mm -hmm. of 
when I work with other people, I'm not sure how well that works for them, but it's, it's quick. I like to work very quickly because also there's no money anymore. So right. you have to work fast. And I would think I with think this album work- too, uh, with this album too, I would think that, that, you know, given all the emotion uh, stirring up with this, that, that you'd also not want to wallow in it, you know? No. And you don't want to, don't want to edit yourself because then that's when the ego and the narcissism kicks like in. The and, second guess. Like I said, the, yeah. yeah, but you have to remember, I didn't think I was going to, I just was making it. I didn't think about putting it out or anything. I just knew I needed to, to, to throw, my lungs needed to throw up and I just had to go and do this. And so I needed moment, to do it also it, to. In the moment of doing it, was it cathartic in the moment? Was it something that as you were making it, that it felt right and good and or was it difficult uh, or was it both no 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 i enjoyed i i if everything that i do i do to make sure that it feels good while while i'm I'm doing it Mm -hmm. um when it doesn't that's when you know you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing and uh i really enjoy um i enjoy the, the the play i enjoy the bathhouse i enjoy being up there i enjoy niles um, and I like, there's nothing more I love doing than recording and mixing. Even I when it's difficult it so... material like this, though. Yeah, but I can, I was able to, once I heard, once you hear songs a couple of times, I was able to remove myself and okay. get into the sonic sounds and, and okay. uh, you know, watch oh. Niley do his thing and lay back and be the, I, I found it, comf- I find it comforting. I, I don't. It was only afterwards where when time passes and you listen to your work and you start thinking, I'm not sure if that's where I'm at anymore. And you, you're you always trying to move forward. So records collect us. Now, I never knew how to put a re- It was Downey that first taught me how to sit on a record. And that was with Secret Path. That was almost three years. And then Andy Kim, when I worked on Andy Kim, it's decided uh, that that took a couple of years to come out. So I started to realize, Oh, you can make a body of work when you're in that, that zone to do so, or in even that schedule to do so. And you can put it and come back to it later if you get behind the work. So that taught me a lot, those two albums. And um, yeah, I have no problem. I, I have no problem now with striking and holding off on putting something out. I think it's really I think whatever that moment is, is only a timeline for, to you, not to to the world or where. where and it doesn't know, exist until it exists, right? I mean. Exactly. Yeah. So do you have other uh, entire albums uh, sitting around like Neil Young that uh, 20 years from now are going to suddenly pop up? Well, 20 years from now, if people wanted to hear my my lost albums. I would be quite happy with that. Um, no, I, I don't. I have. I have a lot. I have a lot of ambient things that I just kind of create, but um, no, I. There's going to be no. I. I mean, I don't. I don't even know what I have. Sometimes I have to go back and figure. Out. I work with Ohad Benjamin a lot as well, and I do feel like at some point, and Ohads do make say think, and we work together on Spirit If. At some point, the Ohad sessions have to come out because I don't know how much stuff's over at his house. But I know Brendan's done the same thing with him, and uh, he's just such a he's just incredible to work with. That um, I'm so lucky that I've been able to be in his house and be in his life and be with his family, and I've recorded so much stuff with him. So maybe there is something. You're making me think on the spot. That's how this works. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I I think I'm. I'm dusting off the 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 interview. Uh huh. No worries. Uh, I don't mind being your being your, right, your, yeah. your practice runs here. Uh. Well, so uh, and is there will there be a children's album? There should be. Yeah, there should be at some point. There has to be. I keep talking to people. People keep. We keep. It's it's in. It's we're calling it in. You know, we're calling it in right now, and I know it's going to happen because there's a lot of great talented people around it. So that should. Uh, that should come into fruition soon. I think now more than ever, especially with kids in today's, with what's going on right now. Uh, I mean, what, what's a children's record going to do? But it, 
you know, if we can get some power behind it, maybe we can get something attached to it that, you know, helps uh, from a charitable, a charitable point of view. And um, yeah, that's, that's definitely, uh, that's on the, on the table of all things. It's just moving slowly, but maybe it's time to speed that up. And, and I, ha I have to ask, I'm sure you've been asked a thousand times and are tired of talking about the, the, the no yes uh, fingers. What's, uh, what's, 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 what's behind that? What's the story there? Well, um, two, two of the most powerful words. Uh -huh. And the story behind it is I wanted a yes and I got it. And after, let me just think about this. I, when was, I guess it was 13. I was working out and I met this woman in India who was just a wonderful human being who was a tattoo artist and beyond her work, I said, do you do letters on fingers? And she, she does it much, she does incredible work, no, but she said, sure. And then I went and did that, I think in 13. And then in um gosh maybe 19 i realized i need no i need to balance this out okay um and i just think they're two two very powerful words and that's the story i have for you they don't but they don't right. it's like uh, exine famously sort of has temptation tattooed on her on her wrist so that when Who she did? reaches uh, exine from x you know oh uh, uh, so that when she, you know, reaches for something, she sees the word right there and, and it, it reminds her. I mean, what, what purpose do these serve for you? Yes and no. I don't know how much more to answer that question. It's, it's, it really comes down to the words and what they represent. And for me, I wanted to live a life of where I was saying yes a lot. And then I realized I needed to reverse that and get some no's in there because it wasn't working for me so much. And I was forcing myself into the yes world. But I mean, I have save us written on my wrist. So when I reach for something like a slice of pizza, I'm always constantly reminding that we need to be saved. So tattoos for me were names. And then I just, I just felt, I don't always have the explanations behind the impulse of what needs to be answered within this realm of what we're doing. But I have my reasons for yes and no, and I think I answered it, didn't I? I guess I did pretty I'll, well. I'll, I'll accept. You that. want something more? What What would you like? What would you? What no, What I... What are you looking for? The personal aspect behind yes and no for me? It's It's just an unusual tattoo, and I I I. It seems to me something that well, obviously you see a thousand times a day, and and that I I just assume must have some purpose in your life is it is it do you hold up the one hand when you like something and the other hand when you do not is it a talk to the hand scenario uh you know yeah. <laughs> no i don't i never really say talk to the hand um <laughs> i would hope no not. It, it, no it's it's mainly for me i do see them every day but i i, I don't at the same time i don't see tattoos as prominently, I, I see tattoos as part of skin now. And I didn't think I would have those glasses on. But now, because I've been around beauty with tattoo, and I am around beauty with tattoo, I see how it, how it forms the person and how it's a reflection, not so much in the art of the person, but just it becomes a part of them. And it's interesting how I don't, as you know, tattoos, especially when people are covered in them, um, you immediately go, whoa, Jesus. But what I think is such a comment to the beauty and the art of it is when you then no longer see the ink, but you just sort of see this as part of the human in front of you. And that was an education and has been an education for me for the last while. And uh, it's really quite beautiful. It's like a really Pretty incredible art when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Most Pretty definitely. incredible art. And how far that goes back to. Oh, yeah. So when I look at my yes and my no, I am not honoring the 
history and the let's say the you know the sacred art of what tattoo is i am i am words and words for me because i was dyslexic and because i was a troubled cut kid growing up and i you know had learning disabilities and all these things that the two words i could always rely on were yes and no mm -hmm. so i got these tattooed on my hand to remind me of the simplicity of how to live life so that's my that answer know. but it, that is the you answer. wanted it I know. I gave the it a simple you. answer. There you go. Wow. <laughs> All right, my friend. Listen, let, let's end this where we started talking about aging. You've been doing this okay. now for, for decades. And obviously, this is what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life in some way, shape, or form. Um, where do you, you know, where do you sort of see yourself? as you get older, as you do this into your fifties and into your sixties, what do you want it to be like? What do you, where do you want to go? What do you want to have happen? You know, I want to, I want to, I want to burn shit down. I want to do something that goes beyond the aspect of words and have, you know, even clean water. I want to fight for clean water. I want to get on board. I want to have my, services be available and be directed by others i want to represent others i want to help others out um and change is something that is becoming further and further and further away from us as we keep going in the direction that we're going in so i'm uh i'm looking forward to my 50s because i want to change it up and i really want to dive into the hypocrisy of it all and just get behind I want to find that group of people and I've been gathering that group. My partner and I have been doing that and um, we're getting some really good people involved. And eventually this is going to have to break just like the song. It's all going to break, not to reference my own tune, but it mm -hmm. has to, and it's not going to be, it's not going to be good. So I'm a hopeful person and I am very much a person of feel the joy, but also I'm an empath. So you have to feel it all. And when you're an empath, six, seven years ago, it was tough. Now it's just, it's it's unreal. And that's why I, I keep a suicide watch on a lot of people in my surroundings, because I think we all understand that that's a heightened notion of how to, I understand when people check out now. I, I, I couldn't, but at this point in my life, I can now. I can understand why they do it. And uh, I don't want people to do that. So I'm I'm sort of here. I'm gonna do this this social scene stuff, and I'll always want to play live. And I love I love art. And I but in this time of where we're at, uh, more has to be done, and um, truth has to be. It has to mean something. It has to mean something, and truth does not mean a lot right now. So. I'm hoping that uh, when that tsunami comes, that I'll be able to be a part of it somehow and and just help others and have them help me and we go out there and do something. And at the same time, I'd like to go back to where I came from and be in the UK and be in Ireland and, and be close to the to the sea and, and uh, be close to my mom and help people out and enjoy it because it's hard to uh, enjoy a lot of things these days, especially everything's becoming so expensive and you can just see the weight on everyone. And uh, I uh, always want to be able to do something that takes that weight away for even just a moment. I understand it's momentary, but I think that really helps. And I think that works. And I think art matters. I think it matters more than ever. We used to find our identities and our communities and our our emotions through what we loved in art. And um, unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. So I hope we get back to that. And I see signs of that coming and it excites me. I'm ex 
I'm excited to see what happens in the turnaround because that's going to have to happen. Right. When it gets so capitalistic, it always some there's always a, and they're better than ever at keeping the, all that at bay. But it's you can see it happening. The people are angry. They're right. angry and they're tired, and they're hurt, um, and they're lashing out. I've been la- I've been lashed out personally for the last couple of years, and I understand. I understand. I don't feel like it should be directed at me, but whatever. It's part of the job because people are mad and people are mad at people in positions of power. They're mad at those who are out there representing something that they're not. They're, they're, they're mad that they've been duped by what they felt was something they believed in. They're tired of being bullied. They're turning into bullies. They're turning on each other. There's families turning on each other through media and through what we're supposed to be doing and what we're not supposed to be doing. And that's got to stop. I could not agree with or you. Butter, more. Yeah, because butter is eight fifty, and if it keeps going, butter is going to be seventeen dollars. And if that's what you want to do, then you better get onto soy. Mm-hmm. But but soy is not good for you. Remember? <laughs> well, nothing. Nothing is good for you. Life will kill you, as I believe Warren Zevon said. The great Warren Zevon. What was his last song that he did that um, keep me in your heart for a while? Keep Keep me me in your heart heart for a while. while. Yeah, yeah. That's what more. I never knew that song. I mean, Hayden has that show Dream Serenade, and last year he said this is going to be our 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 sing along song, and I never heard, heard that song. Keep me in your heart for a while, Warren Zevon. What a beautiful song. Yep, kind of says it all. It's kind of, that's maybe the way to end the interviews. I we think uh, fade is. out to Warren, Warren Zevon. Keep, <laughs> just start smiling. That's just, we'll freeze like a, yeah, yeah. And then keep me, <laughs> keep me in your heart for a while. 